So hello everybody. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful event and for the opportunity to get familiar, to make you familiar with the language that I <laughs> really talk. So what I'm going to talk about is biology. And we all know that biology is a natural science that deals with life. So probably I might be talking your language because we all are living creatures. And let me start my presentation with a simple question, and it's what makes organisms living creatures? And I'm pretty sure that every one of you in the audience has his own answer. Someone will say it's the brain, others will say it's the heart. And I'm going to convince you that the answer is much simpler, and it's DNA. Every living organism, every cell has DNA. Bacteria, have DNA, yeast have DNA, so do any plants and humans. And DNA is the language of our life, so we all are speaking the same language. And undoubtedly, knowing the structure of this important molecule, this is the most important molecule in nature, is of high priority for all scientists. So and there's no surprise that when the structure of DNA has been discovered about 60 years ago, scientists that have discovered the structure have received a Nobel Prize. What's important about this molecule is that it has one and the same structure, chemical composition, in almost all cells, in almost all organisms. It's quite a perfect and very refined molecule. It has four letters and they are C, A, T, G, and they are arranged all along the DNA strand uniquely for every one of us. And knowing the exact order of all these four letters all along the human DNA is what is called sequencing of the genome, knowing all this ordering of the four letters. And just have in mind that human DNA has three billions of these letters, so it's quite a huge task. And at the beginning okay, of the new millennium, the first draft of the Human Genome Project has been announced. And it was about 50 years after the discovery of the structure of DNA. It was a huge project a billion-dollar project that united the efforts of more than 2.5 thousand scientists located in more than 20 laboratories in six different countries. So it's, it's a huge and tremendous project, and he was completed just at the celebration of the 50 years after the, of the discovery of the structure of DNA. And this celebration was crowned by this major scientific event. So now we know that we have an ordered four letters all along the DNA code, and scientists run for sequencing of other genomes just to follow the evolutionary trait of different organisms. So the genome of the monkeys have been sequenced, of the honeybees as well, of the dogs and the chickens, even of the chimpanzees. And when the genome of the chimpanzees have been compared to our genome, guess what? The genetic difference was only 1.5%, which means that by DNA, we are pretty much identical. But by look, by appearance, by the things we do, we are different. I think so, at least in some cases. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what tells identical, almost similar genomes to express differently? how DNA knows which genes to switch on and which to switch off, and how these little differences are expressed so vastly in different organisms. What makes us different is the main question that scientists started asking themselves after the sequencing of the human genome. Why the DNA is not our destiny? Why one and the same DNA functions pretty different? And I think that we are about to answer some of these questions, and it's about to start a fourth revolution. And this revolution will concern our health, and it will concern our 
way of living, even our way of producing energy as well. It is, it is a tremendous uh, discovery and have in mind that we all start from a single cell. Human body has more than 100 trillion cells and they are specialized in more than 300 distinct types. Each type is specialized in specific functions and cells of a specific, of a specific type form tissues and they form our organs and thus a human body is formed. This cell can go this way and can turn into a lung cell, for example. Or it can go this way and can turn into a brain cell. There is another option and it can be this way. And this cell will become a skin cell. Have in mind that all these cells are specialized in quite different functions in our body, but they do have the same DNA, which means that their genome is the same. They have identical genomes. Obviously, there's something in these cells that tells which genes to be switched on and which genes to be switched off. And the main question is, what is this? Let's imagine that we are computers. Logically, DNA is our hardware. In order to function well, this hardware needs proper software programs in order to drive the hardware. The main question is, which are the software programs for our body? Which are the software programs for each of these different cell types that tell them which genes to work and which not? The answer is the epigenetics. And what does epigenetics mean? Literally, it means beyond the DNA sequence. It means beyond DNA and our genomes. It provides information which is not coded in our genes. It's something outside that regulates and that controls our genome. And practically, sorry, practically it tells identical genomes to express differently have identical twins, as an example. They do look alike, and they genetically are identical. But with the time, with the age, they start differing, differing epigenetically, which means that they are susceptible to different diseases, and in some cases, they do die by different diseases. DNA in our cells is not naked. It's located in the nucleus, and is organized with proteins. And these proteins, together with DNA, are transmitting this epigenetic information, and they do tell which genes to work and which not. So it means that the lives of our grandparents, the food they ate, the air they breathed, the actions they did, did they smoke or didn't, even the things they saw, could affect us decades later. And moreover, we can pass and transmit this information to our descendants and can affect our children, grandchildren and grand-grandchildren. As I told you, epigenetics is something above and beyond the genome. And the genome and the epigenome cannot exist separately. And the bridge between them is the environment. Hey, okay. It's the environment. So, <laughs> okay. This is stress, and it's also influencing my epigenetics. And in our lives, in our lives, during our life, we are under extensive stress. And these uh, environmental stimuli can be our diet, can be the way we live, can be even the people who we interact with. And these environmental stimuli are affecting our genome through the epigenome, which means that the epigenetics is bridging the interaction between the genome and the surrounding environment. And as I told you, there is an epigenetics burst in the recent years, and this is a, a real revolution in the field of bioscience. All these books are scientific and also science fictional, and they do aim to 
make you familiar with the way that you can change your genome by influencing your epigenome, by changing your environment, by changing your way of living, and thus trying to be healthier, trying to combat different diseases. It deals with aging, it deals with the way we take food, which means that the epigenetics is the real genie in our genes. It controls the way they work. As I'm a molecular biologist and I come from a molecular genetics lab, our aim is to try to probe, to try to study how different factors and conditions are influencing our genome and epigenome. And if this is the human cell, and this is the place where DNA sits, what we observe in our laboratory is how this DNA is influenced by different stress conditions. These different stress conditions can be UV radiation, it can be different food substitutes, it can be drugs and whatever. And if we put this cell under mild electric field, what we see is that when DNA is damaged, DNA is extended toward the anode and thus forms a comet-like image, which is observed under a microscope. This is a cell and it has a lot of DNA damage. Here is the place where the intact, the healthy DNA is located and here is the tail. And this tail tells us that there is a lot of DNA damages in this cell. And there are methods for quantifying these results and they do tell us how to treat our DNA in order to be healthy and in order to manage in different stress conditions. Some of our results deal with food colorants, food additives and preservatives that we regularly use in our daily practice. We have tested a lot of them, but I'm going to give you the results with some food colorants like fast green, indigo carmine, and erythrozine. This colorant gives the green color, this one gives the blue color, and this one gives the red color of our sweets. And when we treat healthy cells with these three colorants, what we observe is extensive DNA damage, which means that we should be very careful when we use them in our daily practice. Moreover, we're also experiencing the way different all kinds of stress conditions are influencing our genome through the epigenome. And we're monitoring the way the environment is influencing our epigenome, the way gender, even the age, the food and the drugs that we daily uptake, all the social factors, the economic factors, which means that we are experiencing the way we live is influencing our epigenome. And the take-home message that I'm going to leave you with is to try to be responsible for your DNA because all this genetic and epigenetic information you transmit to your descendants and you can transmit this information even to your grand-grandchildren, which means that they can be influenced by things that they haven't even experienced in their lives. So with this, I'm going to thank you for your attention.